Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you very much to, to Kiki and Mira for their very nice introduction. And as usual, I would also like to thank very much all my colleagues in Pete Multibangan Rekatama Patria who organize these events. Uh, I'm amazed to see we've now reached number eight in this series, um, but it's been a great pleasure to do them with, with this incredible team uh, to help. So thanks very, very much. Today I'm switching from purely geotechnical topics to something related to reinforced soil, which is a, an area I've worked in for many years. So um, let's, let's just introduce what we're going to talk about today. So yes, it's the eighth in this series of, of uh, webinars on geotechnical engineering, looking at reinforced soil structures. And I'm going to talk about 11 items. Um, I'll just come back to that in a second. Uh, the, the, the ninth of these uh, webinars will be held next month, uh, where I'm going to look at a particular technique uh, using reinforced soil, which is to do with load bearing bridge abutments. They, 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 are, they are very, um, if you like, high level structures to design. And I think it's very interesting to look at what can be done with these techniques, but that's next month. Here is an outline of, of the, the webinars that we've been holding during this year. And as you can see, we're now in September. Um, and we will continue through to the end of the year and then bring the series to an end. So let's look at some pictures of reinforced soil structures. I, I'm assuming that most people listening in today have some experience or knowledge about this form of structure, but th this is a very nice retaining wall holding up the, the railway that heads off to the Jakarta International Airport. Uh, something a bit different here. This is uh, actually uh, carrying skiers in a ski field in Australia. Here's a wall supporting the parliament building in Brunei. Uh, this is a slope. It, it's a vegetated structure, but it's also a retaining structure. One of the very early ones built here, that was built over 30 years ago, still serving very nicely in Hong Kong. And this very elegant approach structure to a bridge in the Philippines. And then one last picture. This is actually a load bearing bridge abutment. That's a, the sort of structure I want to talk about in the next webinar. So why, why did I choose this, this title? And uh, well, it's because I find in working in this, this field for such a long time now that I, I think there are a few misunderstandings and confusions about some aspects of reinforced soil. Uh, and really, I, I've picked out 11 things. You might say, why 11? Well, um, yeah, 11 is quite a nice number. It gives me about five minutes on each topic, which means I need to get a move on because I know how many slides I have to present to you today. Um, but I could easily have 11 more. There are many topics that I think require discussion in, in this particular field. But uh, let's see how we get on with these topics today. Uh, as I go along, as usual, these little blue boxes will appear from time to time to make a special point or to maybe ask a question or two. May even be related to the quiz at the end of, of the webinar. The material is aimed really at civil engineers who have some involvement in the planning design or supervision of reinforced soil structures. Um, or I hope also the information could be of interest to more experienced either geotechnical engineers or geosynthetics specialists. I, I use a lot of, I, well, I use three main abbreviations to keep, to, to save writing it out all the time when I make the slides. So, uh, these, these three get used quite a lot. RSS, reinforced soil structure, that's the term I'm using there. RSW, reinforced soil wall or retaining wall. And RSB, the reinforced soil block, that's the block of soil that's actually uh, reinforced by the geosynthetic material. So I, I could list to you right now the 11 items, but I thought rather than that, let's just bring them on one by one. So we'll start off with something about principles of reinforced soil. And, and this particular little isometric sketch, I've been using it for years, but it, it shows the main elements of a reinforced soil structure very nicely. Of course, the main part of it is a fill, a soil. Uh, then we have layers of, in this case, geogrid reinforcement buried in the fill uh, and, and some sort of facing. Uh, what, and, and one nice thing about using polymer geogrids is that we can use quite a wide variety of fill types. Likewise, we can use many forms of facing. And in this webinar, I'm 
talking about the use of polymer reinforcement. The word geogrid and reinforcement is really interchangeable, uh, and, and I sometimes use either of those two terms. Here's a nice picture of a wall built a few years ago in the UAE. Um, 18 meters high is quite big. Uh, and you can see that the, the toe has been protected by some riprap because this is a stream bed. Uh, and you can see the, the width of the stream here in an, another view on the same project, quite a big uh, stream bed. And here we can see water actually flowing in the stream. And you can see this is, this is the Middle East where it doesn't rain very often, but when it does rain, it's very heavy. Um, and you can see that rapidly this, this dry stream bed has turned into a major water flow. Here it is further down the, uh, the wall. And in fact, what we're gonna look at now, just down here, somewhere where that red circle is, we're gonna look at that section because when the flow had stopped, and people looked carefully down here, they found that part of the facing of the structure was missing. Um, and what had happened was that the very uh, heavy or the very strong water flows in the channel had actually scoured away the material underneath the facing and it had basically dropped downwards. And there's a view from the front, you can see very clearly what's happened, those are the modular blocks. Um, but what, what is very impressive about that view is that although the facing is now missing in that section, the, the block of reinforced soil has remained perfectly stable. So let's just go back to the beginning again. There's the initial picture. You can now see what happened. They, they had unfortunately forgotten to put the riprap over this section. Um, but if we think about a cross section here, what do we have? We have soil and layers of geogrid designed obviously to meet certain requirements. And on the front, we have a modular block facing. So let's just take away the background and just look at the cross section. So the important point here is that the RSB, the reinforced soil block, is the structure. And it's, com it's a composite consisting of soil and geogrid or, or geosynthetic reinforcement. And the facing is there essentially to make it look nice, to prevent erosion at the, of, the, of the soil at the facing, and also to provide some local stability at the face. Unfortunately, what happened in this case was that there was erosion down at the bottom and the blocks dropped down. Um, but what was very interesting is that despite this happening, the highway remained in service and the crash barrier remained intact. And we can see it here in this picture along the top. So this is after the facing fell away. Uh, and you can see there's no sign of any damage even to the, uh, to the crash barrier. So this makes a very nice important point about reinforced soil being this composite. Uh, what do they do? Well, they repaired it. They, they put the facing blocks back until it was completed. And this time they remembered to add the, uh, the riprap to protect the toe from water flows. So I think this is a very nice demonstration of, of how reinforced soil works as a composite and also that it can withstand some pretty serious situations uh, and recover very nicely. While we're on this section, one more little point I want to make because I often see this appearing and that is, if, you're, if you have a structure like this, do not pile the facing by itself, because I often see this on drawings, that uh, people have a structure like this, and they put a row of piles. Sometimes it's little wooden piles here, we call them cheruchuk, but we often see that just underneath the facing. It's not a good idea. If you do need to improve the foundation conditions, then this should be done by treating the entire reinforced soil block width. So just a few more words about this reinforcement soil composite, because th there's a, some work done here in Japan many years ago. Uh, it was a trial wall. It's reported by Tajiri et al. back in 1996 in one of the Kyushu conferences. Um, and there's a simple cross section. Uh, and you can see six meters high, geogrid's 3.5 meters long and uh, roughly one meter spacing. But there are some little secondary bits to make sure you don't get a local failure at the facing. And you can see there the, the main properties of the fill and the reinforcement. Now, you, many, many trial walls were built like this years ago because people were trying to learn about the technique. But what was particularly interesting in this case is that the researchers arranged to cut the reinforcement inside the soil. They did this by using 
um, electric wires that were embedded, embedded in the fill and you could make them hot. And, and when you made them hot, that would melt through and cut through the geogrid. So they, they gradually reduced the length of the reinforcement. This, this is really the most incredible piece of work. Um, anyhow, there's the first series of cuts. They, they each cut is re removing roughly 30 centimeters of the, the geogrid. And then there's the second series of cuts. So in the, in the cross sections now, brown is intact and green has been cut into short pieces, roughly uh, 30 centimeters in length. The next series, you can see how they shortening the geogrid. And incredibly, they go all the way to this situation and they reach cut number 60 and then the wall fails. Quite an extraordinary piece of work. So what are we gonna learn from this? So if I now go into a stability program, this is, this is a slope stability program and I put in the initial uh, geometry of that structure, there it is, you can see the, the, the spacings of the geogrid and everything connected to the facing. Sorry, I've drawn it the other way around, but I'm sure you can realize that. And I can use a very nice non-circular analysis technique to investigate stability, which I'm going to explain a bit more detail later on, but I'll just do it quickly now. So what we're going to do, we put lots, some random non-circular surfaces there, and we use a special technique to find the critical surface, which is basically the pink colored surface you can see there, it's a two part wedge. Uh, and that is the, the critical one. And we find when we've done that, that the safety factor of just over 1.3. So what we'd normally be aiming for in a structure like this, that's okay. But if I now go to this situation and I do the same analysis, that, that was the situation when they'd reached cut number 60, of course, if I try the same technique, I get very low safety factor. The structure is predicted to collapse. And of course it did at that stage, but just prior to that, it was perfectly stable. So there's something else going on uh, in reinforced soil. There's an additional composite behavior, which we're not really taking into account. Well, um, luckily a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Andrew Lees, um, he, he, he published this paper. I, I helped a little bit, so my name's on there, but Andrew did most of the difficult work. But he looked at this particular situation of the potential benefit, because what's so clever about this experiment is that the reinforcement effect is being reduced, but the effect of the geogrid apertures confining and stabilizing the fill is left behind. And that's what I call the composite effect. So uh, um, Andrew Lees is due to speak to us uh, in an ENA IGS webinar in December. And I'm very much hoping he'll be talking a little bit more about this particular situation. Number three, walls versus slopes. Reinforced, of course, is there a difference? Let's have a look at that. Um, there are differences uh, from a kind of uh, a general point of view. So. Uh, generally, slopes are defined with facing angle less than 70 degrees to the horizontal, and normally they have a, a soft or vegetative facing. And in fact, there are not very many published design guides to reinforce soil slopes. When it comes to walls, they're normally steeper than 70 degrees, normally with a concrete or a hard facing. And there are many published design guides for this form of structure around the world. But let me show you something to give us a bit of a, a feeling about what happens as a structure becomes steeper. So I've drawn a picture here of a, of a block of soil and we'll assume it's stable at a certain angle. And what I want to do now is to add another thin wedge of soil with a top width of 0.1 of the height. And therefore it gives us the facing angle. And from that, we can calculate the weight of that slice. And then we put in the resisting forces from the soil, which of course is a normal force and a shear force. And we do some calculations. I'm gonna use a phi of 30 degrees. We can calculate the weight of, the, of, the, uh, of the, the thin slice. And we can draw a force diagram because we know the weight of the slice. We know the direction of the normal force N. And because of the phi value, that limits the value of S. And of course, what's happening here is that we cannot complete the force diagram. So of course, as we know, the wedge simply slides off. We, we know it fails. 
But what I can do from this, I can form a relationship by plotting the, this shear resistance in terms of the weight of the slice as the facing angle increases. And the diagram looks like this. So facing an angle along the horizontal axis and the shear resistance on the vertical one. And as so as the facing becomes steeper, the resistance from the soil is reducing simply because you're tipping it up more and more steeply. So it's failing. But what we can do to prevent the failure is to add force from reinforcement. We call it T. And I can now do the same thing again. I can do some calculations. I can draw a force diagram. But now, because of T being present, I can complete the force diagram and I can get a stable situation. It looks like that. And I can therefore now calculate S over W as the facing angle increases again. So we'll go back to this graph and we get the blue line. So the blue line is the resistance from the soil when the reinforcement is added. And therefore the difference between the two is the additional soil resistance generated due to the presence of the reinforcement. Now what you can see is as the structure becomes steeper, the generation of additional shear resistance from the reinforcement is getting higher and higher. Of course, that's one of the clever benefits of reinforced soil. We're using the failure of the soil to kind of stabilize itself. That, that's why it works so well. I can also draw a diagram of the required tensile force in relation to the weight of the, of the, of the wedge or slice. And you can see that the required force from the reinforcement increases, increases very rapidly as the facing angle becomes steeper and, and becomes very high as we approach 90 degrees, which of course would be a vertical retaining wall. So we can see this also in design charts. The, these are the, the, the slope design charts which were published by Schmertman many years ago. And one of the charts gives you a thing called the force coefficient on the vertical axis against the slope angle on the horizontal axis. And you can see how the force requirement is increasing as slope angle becomes higher. So for example, if we compare 45 degrees and 78 degrees facing angle, then we get a much greater requirement for reinforcement. So is there a difference? Well, the first difference is there's a very different contribution to the internal stability from the reinforcement. It's much greater in retaining walls than slopes. And there is a difference in terms of design methods. Design methods for walls and slopes tend to be different. Although if you're going to analyze using something like limiting equilibrium or FEA, then you can apply those methods in exactly the same way to walls and slopes. In fact, I did tackle this topic in a, uh, a paper published in an UNPA uh, event, the Slope 2019 in Bali. This, this, this paper here, uh, if you're interested, we can certainly let you have a copy. But that, that looks at this whole issue of, of, of retaining wall design compared to reinforced soil slope design. Number four. Effective stress design. This, this is something that is one of the most important things to get right. And what do I mean by that? Well, when we are designing a reinforced soil structure, and here's a typical cross section, three zones of material, a reinforced fill, a back fill, and a foundation. And I've referred to them as S1, S2, and S3. Then which uh, strength parameters do we use? Because we need for the soil layers, unit weight and shear strength. And also, of course, if water is present, we need to take into account water pressure. So uh, what do we do? Well, we go to site, we get a nice big sample of fill, and then we carry out all sorts of index property testing to, to find out what the soil consists of, we maybe classify it. Uh, and then we normally do a compaction test to find out information about the optimum water content and maximum dry density. And then having done that, we can prepare samples to carry out shear strength tests. But here's one of these blue reminders. The shear strength tests must be appropriate for the design requirements. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, there are two principal definitions of soil shear strength which we use. The first is what we call drained or effective stress, where the important parameters are C dashed and phi dashed. And the dashed is important because the dashed indicates that we, are, we have strengths in terms of effective stress.
Then we have an alternative one, which is undrained shear strength, where we simply say the strength equals the undrained shear strength. Um, and, and these are two definitions which we use in geotechnical engineering. And if we draw a little, have a little table of our three soil zones, S1, S2, S3, well, S1 and S2 are generally fills, almost always fills, um, but S, S3 could be a natural foundation soil. But the point is for the, for the, the fills, then for all soil types, coarse, fine, clay, whatever it is, then we use the drained or effective stress parameters, C dash and phi dashed. It's slightly different in the foundation, but that's not the, the topic today. We're just thinking really about the fills. We would never use undrained shear strength in the, the fill soils. In fact, why do I put C dashed in brackets? Well, most published codes and, and, and standards recommend that you would use C dashed is zero or very a very low value for reinforced soil design. Now here's a slight problem because when we look at available strength tests that you might use to determine these properties, then we are rather limited, especially for fine soils. So if we're talking about fine soils, and we're often using fine fills here in Indonesia and many other parts of Southeast Asia, then we basically have a choice of triaxial CU or CD tests or slow shear box testing. And the slight problem is that effective stress tests on fine soils uh, tend to be expensive. And this, this can lead to difficulties. Now, in, in the earlier webinars, in particular MRPs one, two, and three, I went into some detail about soil properties, index properties, also using the shear box and also the triaxial test. So if you want to know more about that, I, I, I'd suggest if you, well, we can recommend that you look back at those. That I, I think they're easily available if you'd like to review those both as a, a video and also there are PDF versions of all of those uh, webinars. So there we are, extensive information in those earlier ones. So let's just remind ourselves about what an effective stress test looks like, in this case on a fine sand. So we have, in this case, from a shear box, shear stress versus horizontal displacement. And then also very useful to know the vertical displacement of the shear box versus the horizontal displacement, which I plot underneath it. And then from the upper diagram, and knowing the normal stresses, we can derive the phi values by plotting shear stress against normal stress. This is all very basic stuff and discussed in great detail in, in the second webinar. And then I've, I've got a little table down here with some important information. And in fact, that information in that box really is the, plus the diagrams, this is the minimum information you require to make an assessment of a, a shear box test. And this test is, is very adequate to give you C dash and phi dashed for a sand like this. And one of the really important things to notice here, it's a fast shear test, and the rate of shearing was 0.8 of a millimeter per minute, perfectly acceptable for a sand. If I now switch this picture to a fine soil, so this is a similar test on a fine sandy clay, also a picture we looked at back in one of those early webinars, then we can get very nice results in terms of effective stress, in other words, C dash and phi dash for a fine soil, but the test has to be a consolidated slow shear box test. So if we now look in the tabulation down below, we see a rate of shearing of just 0 0.0072 millimeters per minute. So it's very, very slow. So if you want to get suitable results from this kind of testing in terms of effective stress, then you need to test slowly. I made this point also back in uh, the, the second webinar that the Indonesian standard which covers this test method appears to have a slight error in the way you calculate the rate of shearing. Basically, it's 50 times too fast. Now, having talked about the importance of using effective stress and how we might measure it, I'm now going to come to a special topic, which I give a special title to. I did mention this actually in, in one of the earlier webinars as well, but I call it the high C, low phi problem in fine soils because I see it frequently. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a table of some data here. This is from a, uh, an, an, a site investigation report in Indonesia many years ago that I, I received. 
And you can see all the nice information here, various index properties. You can see if you look down the column on the left-hand side with values and all the standards are mentioned there, Atterberg limits, a summary of particle size. And then at the very bottom, we have direct shear tests. Now that particular SNI standard there is for an unconsolidated fast shear test. So the values you see there of C and phi, these are what I call high C, low phi results. And if you want to look at an actual test result like this, so here is a, a fairly fine soil. It's an A27 soil, low plasticity soil. It's a desert soil in this case, but this is a fast shear box test. And how do we know that? Because if we look at the table of data there, we can see the rate of shearing was 0.8 millimeters per minute on a fine soil. So what do we get? We get this kind of behavior, high C, low phi. Now, if you're presented with that data to design a reinforced soil structure, you shouldn't use it. You need to make some kind of reassessment and try to de decide what would be a suitable C dash and phi dash to use, maybe based on index testing. What's going on? Well, here's another picture of a shear box. It's just a shear stress, normal stress result. Um, and this is a fast shear box test on clay. And you can see we get this very flat <coughs> line. So we've got the high C, low phi. Why is that happening? Well, the problem is that the, the three normal stresses there, the sigma n values of 40, 120, and 200, they are total stresses. They're not effective stresses. We don't know what the effective stress is during the test because we cannot measure the pore pressure simply in a shear box. So that's the problem. So that's why we cannot use that kind of result to design a reinforced soil structure. We need to have results like this. In this case, maybe carried out by a slow shear box test. And that would be a typical result there for a fine soil. So why is there a difference? Well, the difference is that the distances between those data points are the pore pressures. So at the high stresses, we get positive pore pressure and the low stresses, we get negative pore pressures. And because of that, it, it kind of, it turns the envelope and gives us the red one. Whereas what we really want to have is the blue one. And that would give us the right kind of properties. So, Sometimes I talk about this and it, and it remains difficult to convince people. So to help convince people, I'm gonna show you the results of designing a reinforced soil structure for two sets of strength data. They're the two you see there. So we're gonna use C dash of two kilopascals and phi dash of 27 degrees, very typical for a, a fine soil. And then we're gonna use the C of 30 and phi of 10 degrees. I typically, I, I, I purposely leave, leave off the dash because those are not effective stress strengths. And we'll look at the difference or the effect of those two sets of strength property has on the design. So here's the problem, a 12 meter high structure, 85 degrees. And the problem, the first problem is to find the highest possible unreinforced soil slope with a safety factor of 1.3 for the two soil strength values given there, the, the one and the two, which I mentioned earlier on. So what you would do, you put that into a slope stability program and you, you basically move the circles further and further down the facing until you start to get a safety factor less than 1.3. So what are those heights? Well, for the C dashed and phi dashed values, it's just 0.5 of a meter, and then you start to get failures. But for C of 30 and phi of 10, even a six meter height doesn't, it still has an adequate safety factor without any assistance from reinforcement. So we already see a bit of a problem there. What's problem number two? So problem number two is to take the same situation and to find a layout of reinforcement with, with the safety factor as close as possible to 1.3 everywhere throughout the slope. It, it takes a lot of time to do that, but not too difficult. With a, with a nice piece of software, you can do that. So Let's look at the results. So I've done this in a, a, a program called Tensar Slope. And you can see there the layout of reinforcement. I hope you can make it out there, the red lines, the eight meter uh, height of the structure. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we, we have 
um, actually, sorry, it's 12, bigger, it's 12 meters high, not eight, it's 12 meters high. So we have a very nice layout of reinforcement. And you can see what we have is a closer spacing at the bottom and the spacing becoming slightly wider at the top with a gap of a half a meter at the very top because that was the maximum height without reinforcement. Uh, we found that earlier on. So this is what we expect to see. Typical layout of reinforcement to, uh, to, to reinforce or stabilize a structure of that height. So we're happy with that, but that's for C dash of two and phi dash of 27 degrees. If I switch, oh, sorry, sorry, the safety factor down there, just over 1.3 everywhere. If I now switch to C of 30 and phi of 10, then this is the required layout of reinforcement. First of all, we have the huge six meter gap at the top because that doesn't require any reinforcement. But then we get a very dense packing of the reinforcement towards the bottom. It's not what we expect. Yet that's what you'll get if you use the high C, low phi to design a reinforced soil structure. It's clearly incorrect. No one would want to accept that as the, as the design, but that's what you get from those properties. Safety factor still just over 1.3. Same number of layers of geogrid. So the main reason, just to remind you one more time, why, why do we get the high C, low phi? Generally because people are measuring strength in fast shear box tests because they're cheaper. That's the normal reason. Unfortunately, the slow shear box test could take a week or so to carry out. Clearly it's more expensive. There is a lot more information about clay fills in general in the fourth webinar. Uh, again, you can, you can see that or get hold of the PDF of these slides if you wish to. And that covers topics like pore pressures in clay fills and the importance of certain drainage measures that should be taken when you consider using fine fills. Number six. Number six is something which is very basic to reinforce soil. It's all about interaction. Interaction between fill and reinforcement. So here's a nice photograph which I've used for many years to show people how nicely geogrids can embed themselves in soil. So you get a very good interaction between the two materials. And there are two kinds of interaction we want to understand, sliding and pull out. So how do we measure this? Well, to get sliding interaction information, we carry out a large shear box test and we adapt the shear box so that we can fix a piece of geogrid in the bottom half like that. Then we put the, the, the shear box together and we fill up the top half with some fill as well. And we carry out the shear box test. So what we'll have is a cross section, something like this. So that when we do the shearing, we're pushing the top half, which is soil over the bottom half, which is soil and geogrid. So we get an indication of the effect of the geogrid on the sliding resistance. And of course, we normally do the same test without the geogrid to get um, a base value for the soil by itself. So that's the sliding interaction test. Pull out is generally more complex because you need a, normally a bigger piece of equipment, uh, something like this, where you bury the geogrid in a box, fill it up, apply a load, and then you go out to the front of it and pull on it to, to do the pull out test. To be honest, these are normally more of a research level test. And this would be a typical section. So you can see how I've shown here the, the, the normal stress being applied by an airbag, which is another way of doing it, where you, you pressurize the airbag. Um, and what you do, you're pulling towards the left and you have the geogrid buried down there. Now I'm, I'm talking in this case about geogrids, which have fairly thick transverse members on them. Uh, and what we normally do then is we attach transducers to those to measure the movement of each individual part of the geogrid. And the kind of result we get from that would be something like this. Now this graph shows the, the load being measured at the, at the clamp versus the displacement. And then the different colored lines represent different points along the geogrid. So the red line would be the clamp itself. And then we get bars one, two, three, and four going all the way back to the buried end of the geogrid. And clearly at the far end of the geogrid, the displacement is much smaller because as you load the geogrid, the geogrid by itself becomes longer. It extends. So this actually makes pullout testing quite complicated and sometimes quite difficult to interpret. 
But that's what a typical result can look like, especially when the pullout is incomplete. For pullout tests to work well, you need to have quite short pieces of geograid, especially if the normal stress is high. Otherwise, you simply can't pull the material out. Anyhow, I thought I would show you, oh, one important point here. Uh, so let me just go to this blue point is that when we do interaction testing, whether it's pull out or sliding, it needs to be an effective stress test. It needs to be a drain test. If you remember the discussion earlier on about effective stress design. Now that's easy for coarse soils, for gravels and sands, no problem at all. But it's very difficult for fine soils. It's my experience that in the literature, there are very few published results of genuine effective stress interaction tests. Simply because if you have a large shear box and you put a clay fill into it, it takes a very, very long time to shear if you want to make sure it's an effective stress result. Now, let me just show you um, how the different kinds of shear interaction relate to each other. So I'm going to show you some results from doing interaction testing in this case, with a medium to coarse sand and gravel with three grades of geogrid. And there are three different kinds of tests going on. The soil to soil sliding, which would look something like this section here. So we have a 50 kilopascal surcharge on the top, and we simply push the soil in the top part across the soil in the bottom part to get the soil uh, shear strength. So that's a typical soil um, shear box test. We then do the one with the geogrid in it, which looks like this. So now it's same basic test, except now we have the piece of geogrid clamped at the midpoint to give us the effect of sliding over geogrid rather than sliding over soil or sliding over geogrid and soil. And those are both carried out one millimeter per minute because it's a coarse soil. And then finally, we have the soil to geogrid shear generated by the pullout test. Now this is a slightly different situation because you have shear going on on both sides of the geogrid. But I'm just going to show you a comparison of the shear resistance or shear stress generated on one side only in each case. So we look at that in the graphs that follow. And in this case, uh, for all seven tests, that's one soil test, three sliding interaction and three pullout tests. The one thing that's the same is that we have a 50 kilopascal normal stress that's about two and a half meters below the top of a structure. So here is, I'm just showing the shear stress versus, versus displacement diagram, but here is the basic shear box test on the soil where you see the peak value dropping down to the constant volume value. But we, we normally expect that in a well compacted uh, soil. We then add to that diagram, the sliding interaction tests. And you can see that they don't quite get that sharp peak, but after some displacement, they end up at shear stresses slightly less than the soil by itself, which is what we'd expect. And that gives us the interaction factor. But when it comes to pull out, again, just looking at the shear, oh, just to remind us that we have three grades of geogrid. You can see them there in the legend, a 520, 560, and 580. Basically the 520 is the thinnest and 580 is the thickest. So when we look at the shear, sorry, the pull out test, looks like this. We're looking at the shear on one side only, and we get those lines. Now, the reason why we go to much bigger displacements is that the displacement is measured at the clamp. Think back to the earlier diagram I showed you. Um, but what's interesting here is that the thickness of the geogrid, in this case, is having a very big effect on the generated pullout resistance. And that's not surprising. Let's have a bit of a think about that, because we can see from that testing that when it came to direct sliding, there was a slight drop off in resistance due to sliding over the geogrid and soil combined. But when it came to pull out, this was significantly affected by the, the thickness of those transverse bars I mentioned earlier on, because they create a greater anchorage as they become thicker. Now, here's a very nice picture. This is made many, many years ago. Just think of it like a kind of X-ray picture of a piece of geogrid being pulled through soil where the whitish color is compression being generated in front of the transverse bars, which are here, the white blobs. And basically, you can, you can probably guess from this, as those, those white blobs become 
fatter, they're going to generate more pullout resistance. And that's what we saw in that previous result. So that was a few words about interaction testing and what we have to do to learn about it. But what about the relative importance of sliding versus pullout? Well, just a few slides on this, but um, this is something where I, I see a lot of confusion. I, I, I see a lot of effort being placed maybe in the wrong direction when it comes to doing this testing. But let's make, have some words first and then we'll demonstrate this. So here is a typical cross-section through a reinforced cell structure with a, a sliding mechanism there, sliding over geogrid. Now, the point is, if you have a sliding mechanism over geogrid, then the sliding interaction factor affects the entire length of the geogrid and clearly has a major influence on the design. That's really important. Now, if we switch this little diagram to looking at pullout, something like this, so we're looking at the pullout at the second grid from the bottom there, then pullout has a very minor influence on the design because the length of geogrid, which is actually involved in the pullout resistance is very short, especially at the bottom of a, of a tall structure. Maybe the top geogrid or the top two geogrids may be slightly critical, but towards the base of a structure, pullout is of little, little consequence and not, not important at all. I am talking here, of course, about geogrids though. I'm talking about materials which, which are continuous in their extent in all directions, rather than strips or straps. I'm talking about geogrids, and, and this is the the um, this is this is the the kind of uh, message I would like to get across. But how can we demonstrate this? So I'm now going to go to a a piece of software called Tensile Soil, which we can use to design reinforced soil structures. And I've set up here uh, an eight meter high retaining wall with a surcharge on it. I've chosen reasonably uh, moderate quality fill. And I found myself a stable layout there using one of the US tieback wedge design methods. And um, this, this design is fine, it's good. Now, to make this design, I set all of the interaction factors to a value of one. That's sliding on the geogrid, sliding on the base, all, all, all of those, those and, and there's a piece of geogrid at the bottom of the structure. So you get sliding on, on, on the geogrid at the base of the structure as well. So I'm now going to go into my interaction factor input window, and I'm going to go to the pullout one that's just there inside the red um, circle, and I'm going to change it. I'm going to halve it to 0 0.5. So that means that when you have a, a pullout interaction, we only take half of the soil st shear strength rather than the full shear strength. And we set that, and when that happens, you can see in the, in, the, in the little diagram in the middle of the screen now, we see there we have a, a sign that says PO, it's a pullout failure. The top geogrid has a slight problem in pullout. Well, we can fix that very easily. So what do we do? We go into this design method and we're going to make the top geogrid one meter longer. We go, okay. And you can just see it there and that fixes the problem. So if you do have a slight pullout problem, it'll be at the top and you can easily fix it by doing something like that, depending on the design method. Now, let's do the same thing now with the sliding interaction. So we go back into this window and I'm gonna change the sliding interaction coefficients to 0 0.5. So what does that mean? It means that when you have a sliding interaction, you take half of the soil shear strength rather than the full soil shear strength on that sliding plane. And if we do that and we analyze we get all sorts of no's. You can see there sliding external stability and sliding internal stability. You see the yellowish and red no, because it's not adequate. And if you look on the cross-sectional diagram, you can see lots of sort of fat red lines indicating sliding over those, those layers of geogrid. How do you fix the problem? You simply have to make the geogrid longer. There's no other way to do it. So currently the length of the base of the structure is 5.6 meters. And by a little bit of trial and error, we find out we need to make that 8.2 meters to get rid of all of those sliding failure messages. It's a huge, huge effect. 
So by way of summary, in the case I showed you, it won't always be identical every time you do it, but it'll be similar. So reducing the pullout interaction factor from one to 0 0.5 required a one meter lengthening of the top geogrid. Whereas reducing the sliding interaction factor from one to 0 0.5 required that geogrid length was increased from 5.6 meters to 8.2, which is almost a 50% increase in cost of the geogrid reinforcement in that case. So it has a major effect. I, I make this point because people are remarkably interested in pullout resistance and you get all sorts of research into it uh, and, and, and you get a lot of papers published about it. You get far fewer papers published about sliding interaction, yet that is actually the important one. And luckily it's the easier one to do because um, th those 30 centimeter shear boxes, they can be found here and there, but a pullout apparatus is quite rare. Now we're on, we're on to number eight, and I think time is looking quite good. Um, and I want to move now to a different but very, very important topic, which is all about durability and degradation of polymer reinforcement. And a few words about that. If I look to European practice, uh, then there, there is a European standard, 13251, which, which tells you about the, the requirements for using geosynthetics uh, as, as reinforcement in things like retaining walls and so forth. And then there is a, a very good supplementary document, the technical report 20432, which gives a lot of detailed information and guidelines about determining long-term strength of geosynthetics for soil reinforcement. If you want to see similar information in US practice, there is an Ashto R69. I, I see from the internet, the latest version is just last year, 2020. I, I don't have that version of it. I think I have an older one, but it gives you similar kinds of advice about how you should approach determining uh, the, the long-term strength of geogrid, taking into account various um, things that can affect it. And that's what I want to look at. Before I get there, I just want to talk about these modes of degradation. Now, these are diagrams coming from that technical report I mentioned, where they, they designate um, forms or, or degradation um, procedures as, as in three modes. Mode one is where, if we look at a residual property, which for example, could be the tensile strength versus time, it drops very quickly at the beginning and then it doesn't change very much after that. Obviously installation damage would be like that. And then mode two is a gradual reduction throughout the lifetime of the structure. Um, that would be some chemical effects. In this case, you can determine a reduction factor based on time uh, and, and you can put that into your, into your assessment of geogrid long-term strength. And then there is mode three in which Nothing much happens until you get almost to the end of the design life and then there's a sudden reduction in strength. In this case, a reduction factor in, in the normal way doesn't make much sense, but what we have to do is restrict service life to make sure we don't reach that sudden downturn in that particular uh, degradation. So th those are very useful concepts. So what I want to talk about in the next few minutes uh, are some of the, um, the typical durability problems that we investigate. The, the, the four main things are weathering, which is UV exposure, in other words, to the atmosphere, and then microbiological degradation, oxidation, and the effect of liquids, principally acids and alkalis, and others on, on strength of polymers. Um, I'm going to concentrate on oxidation. I don't have time to, to cover everything. These are investigated in two ways. We have what are called screening tests, which are relatively quick. Um, and they're generally used in approvals. And, and also we have lifetime prediction tests. Now the lifetime prediction test is similar to a screening test in some ways, but generally carried out over longer time periods, a bigger range perhaps of temperatures or however, however it's being done. Um, and they, they're gonna take longer basically. But they are vital if you want to predict reduction factors for typical reinforced soil structure lifetime, let's say 100 years or so. Here is a list of the, the European standard um, screening tests. You can see there those four main 
degradation procedures, weathering, microbiological oxidation and resistance to liquids, acids and alkalis. And those are their titles. We don't need to uh, read those today. But just a brief mention here, these are the targets you're trying to reach in each of those ones. I'd have to say on the whole, they are not particularly onerous. If we look at oxidation there, after 112 days at 10 degrees centigrade, you need to retain 50% strength. Well, 50% is half. That's not a very wonderful target for, for a, a typical polymer reinforcement, even under those conditions. Um, so uh, let's just also understand a little bit about screening tests because um, this European standard 13251 is all, I mentioned it earlier on, uh, and it has an annex B, and I'm afraid there are lots, I don't like lots of words on slides, but I've got quite a few words here, but I just want to make one point that's mentioned in this standard, talking about these screening tests. You can see two of them mentioned there. It says, the tests described in this annex do not allow for the determination of reduction factors and are screening tests to show the ability of a product, product to serve for a certain time. So these cannot really be used for long-term determination of um, the life of a geosynthetic reinforcement material. Let's go briefly back to oxidation and talk about that for a couple of minutes. And um, I'm, then, I'm gonna show you um, one way of examining oxidation. Oxidation is one of the problems for the polyolefins like um, HDPE and polypropylene. And, and therefore we have to look at it very carefully. Um, but in this case, we're going to look at testing using what's called an autoclave, which is a, um, a, some kind of cylinder where you put the, the, the material inside there and you apply, in this case, high temperature and high pressure, uh, and you take out specimens from time to time and test them to see what's happening to their strength. Uh, and here's a typical result. So you see residual strength on the vertical axis versus the time of exposure inside the autoclave on the horizontal axis. And you can see that mode three behavior very clearly. So up to about, what, 220 days, no loss of strength, but then it suddenly drops off. That's at 60 degrees centigrade and 51 bars. The green data is for 70, and the red data is for 80 degrees. And from interpretation of this, which is a fairly specialist thing, then we don't come up with reduction factors. We come up with design life. And you can see there, even at 30 centigrade for this particular material, it's pretty high, almost 250 years predicted design life in terms of oxidation. So if we're looking at durability of either mode two or mode three, then this type of uh, lifetime prediction testing is required to be confident about the, um, the long-term behavior of the material. Durability screening tests by themselves are not sufficient. Now, another point I'd like to make here is one, you might say, what does this mean? Creep of polymer reinforcement is not degradation. It's because I see this being mentioned quite often and, and I think it's, um, it needs some explanation. So here are some, in this case, HTP geogrids laid out on the site behind a retaining wall facing. And to determine their long-term properties, we carry out what are called creep tests. And then we put the information combined with other reduction factors into a formula like this. This is typical US practice. We take into account creep, site damage, and uh, environmental effects like chemical and oxidation. They're all going in there. Uh, and that gives us the, the allowable strength. I want to talk briefly about creep. Um, a creep test looks like this, whereby we hang up a, a sample, we put a weight on the bottom, and, and we simply measure strain against time, and we leave it there for a long time. Um, so uh, this gives us a very good idea about long-term performance of these materials. And then the data is plotted in this way, where we have the load applied versus the time, in this case, to rupture. And, and the relationship is that red line you can see there. And the time axis is, is logarithmic and it's in years. So I've put a dot there at around about 120 years, which is a typical design lifetime. And then that gives us the load we should apply to make sure that the rupture only occurs at that point in time. 
What happens at the shorter times? Well, we can't really measure that with creep testing. It would be a bit dangerous to, to arrange a creep test to fail in a few seconds. But um, we can look at this with tensile testing. And tensile testing, this is a typical test using the ISO standard uh, where the rate of elongation is 20% per minute. So this one finishes in about 30 seconds. So we can add that kind of information to the diagram like this, and, and that's where it would come. So if we call that a 100% of tensile strength, then that occurs at 30 seconds, and we get now a more complete relationship. But we can add another line here, which is called the residual strength. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that as time goes on, the actual tensile strength in that geogrid is remaining the same. It's only when you approach the design life, you get this drop off because it's a mode three behavior. How does it work then? Well, um, in our own creep laboratories, we, we have quite a few creep laboratories. For, for many years, uh, every time we took down a creep test, even one after several years, we would check its tensile strength using the same procedure to measure the tensile strength before the test started. And then we compare the two. So here is a graph showing the retained tensile strength compared to the strain reached in the creep test. And what you can see for the majority of the data, it's around about 100%. This means you take down a specimen after say five years, been, it's been resting there with a high load on it, and you measure its tensile strength using a, a fast test, and that strength remains the same, and that's the residual strength. There are some points here which were close to rupture, and they had dropped down in terms of their tensile strengths. What's affected more than that is the retained strain at failure. So we find that the strain of failure does reduce a bit, not surprisingly, because you stretch the, the, the geogrid. So what I can do, I can add that data, there, the, the, the black symbols for the 20 centigrade data to this diagram. Uh, and you can see how it's working now. And often people will look at that and say, okay, well, in that case, why don't we design for 100% tensile strength? Well, problem was, if you do that, it, it fails in 30 seconds. We need to set that particular long-term strength to make sure that that rupture occurs at the required design lifetime. If we were to do a tensile test which finished in three seconds, it would look something like that. That's quite difficult to do. So we would then have a different reference. If we followed the ASTM procedure, which is a slower test rate for tensile testing, it would be the green line. So one thing that's important to realize is that when you look at creep reduction factors, you need to be aware of the standard used to measure the tensile strength because it can affect the creep reduction factor. Creep is absolute, but tensile strength depends on the procedure used to measure it. So just a little point to make from this. Um, and here's back to that diagram of the three modes of behavior, one, two, and three. Creep is mode three. So here's an interesting point that say, as we often do in research, we recover some polymer geogrid from say an old structure, 10 years old, we take out a piece, we dig it out of the soil and we test it. And we might find a reduction in strength. So there we are say at 10 years. And that reduction in strength is gonna come principally from the initial installation damage combined maybe with chemical effects or exposure, if it's an exposed piece of geogrid, UV light, but not from creep, not to any significant extent because creep is not degradation. And, and I hope that this little discussion uh, gets that point across. But we still have to take into account long-term behavior uh, in terms of a creep reduction factor. Now, just two points to go, and I think we'll be through in, in, in the next 10 minutes. But this is one which I, I've seen confusion over. Safety factors, wall design versus stability analysis. Let's have a look and see what I'm talking about. So let's take a very simple cross-section of a reinforced soil retaining wall. You can see there the layers of geogrid and so on. We're used to that cross-section. And I want to do a calculation for sliding on the base of the, of the wall. 
And there would be the, the formulae I need. The driving force would take into account the earth pressure, and the resisting force would take into account the weight of the soil and the, uh, the frictional resistance on the base. Well, let's, let's just assume that the sliding interaction factor is one in this case. It, it doesn't really matter for what I'm doing. So let's take some typical values. I'll make it five meters high. I'll give it some properties. And then we'll do some calculations. We calculate that resistance, which comes to 52 times the length. And we calculate the driving force, which comes to 75. Of course, this is in kilonewtons per meter. And then having done that calculation, to get a safety factor of 1.5, we simply put R equals to 1.5 times S. And that gives us a length of 2.17 meters to get that required safety factor. So let's change it now. Let's make L 2.17 meters. So that length is giving us the required safety factor of 1.5 against sliding on the base. But what I'm now going to do, I'm going to reanalyze, but I'm going to set the soil strength value to a, to a different, I won't call it phi, I'm going to call it theta now. And I'm then going to find a value that makes R equal to S without any safety factor on sliding. So I change, you can see down there inside the black circles, I'm going to change that to a, a thing called theta, like that. And I can then do my calculations again, because there is the equality I need to get the required safety factor. And if I put the numbers into that, I get this, I get a certain number times tan of phi equals a certain number times the Ka value. Of course, Ka includes phi. So the only way I could solve that was to make a spreadsheet and do it by trial and error. But to do that, I found that the phi should be 26.05 degrees. And then if I compare that to the original phi of 30, then the ratio of the tangents, which is how we normally would calculate a safety factor on soil shear strength, that ratio is 1.235. It's not 1.5, it's 1.235. And perhaps to make it even clearer, if I put that wall into a slope stability program, and I use, in this case, a non-circular technique, I find that my safety factor also is slightly different, 1.236. But this is a rather important thing to realize. Important conclusion that when we look at either a wall design method or stability analysis, then we get safety factors or we use safety factors. So if we have a 1.5 from the wall analysis, then when we look at the method of slices, which is applied to the soil shear strength, and it's applied everywhere within the soil mass, not just on the base of the structure, then we get a different value. And in nearly all situations, F from the wall design method is gonna be greater than F from the method of slices instability analysis. Last thing, and I think we'll finish in the next five minutes. So, and this is something which is a bit of a passion for me, which is uh, the approach to internal stability calculations. And, and I did actually use the similar slides in um, a Tensar webinar, not quite recently, but I think the audience today is largely different. So I hope you don't mind me using them again. So, when it comes to internal stability, I like to start with what I call extreme cases. So if we have our block of reinforced soil without any reinforcement, and then the backfill behind it and the foundation soil, which we're used to that particular cross section now, then if we have no reinforcement, then I ask you, what's the critical failure surface? Then if you can remember back to your earth pressure theory, you'll tell me almost certainly it's the Rankine um, uh, wedge given by an angle of 45 plus five by two, uh, like that. And you'd be right. So let's go to another case. So I'm now going to fill up my reinforced soil structure with reinforcement, but I'm going to give it zero strength. You might say that's a bit strange. However, it's just to make a point. So what is now the critical mechanism is going to be the same because if it has no strength, then you're going to get that same rank in critical surface. Right, now let's go to another extreme case and let's give the reinforcement infinite strength. That means that the failure mechanism cannot touch it because as soon as it touches it, it gets an infinite resistance. That means that the 
critical mechanism is going to be a surface going in between the lower two geogrids and coming up the back at the Rankin angle. That would be the critical mechanism. So let's now move away from these extreme cases and go to some, well, less extreme. We'll now look at finite strength reinforcement. And if we do that, then almost certainly our critical mechanism will be some form of two-part wedge in between those two extremes we looked at just now, something like that. And what we will find, or if we do a bit of thinking about this, we'll realize that if you have relatively strong soil and weak reinforcement, you'll tend to get your two-part wedge somewhere up there. And if you have relatively weak soil and strong reinforcement, it'll come down because the, the surface where it goes through the geogrid wants to avoid the geogrid as much as possible. So it comes down to a lower angle. So you're going to have a variety of possible two-part wedge mechanisms depending on the situation. One more extreme case is if I make the geogrid extremely long, but still finite strength, then the critical mechanism is going to come back to the Rankine wedge, like that. All right, nice in pictures. What about in reality? Is that what's going to happen? So I've looked at this using stability analysis. Um, and I've used a, a very nice technique. I've used it already in, these, in this webinar, but I'm going to explain it slightly more detail now. But um, I've used a program called Tensar Slope, and I've used a very special non-circular search routine called a, a genetic algorithm, SGA for short. And the way this works is that we put into it a, a random surface, and then the program will refine it until it finds the lowest safety factor. And in the particular case I'm going to show you, the, the random surface is made of 15 little lines, which means that with 15 lines, you could end up with almost any shape. Uh, what I mean by that is, if there are 15 random lines like that, if that's our starting point, and we let the procedure refine this to find the critical surface, well, it could easily be a circle or look like a circle, say for like Bishop, or it could end up being a nice, linear wedge, maybe. Or it could even end up being some kind of exotic logarithmic spiral like that, which is a well-known uh, mechanism often used in reinforced soil. So let's go into the software and let's see what happens. So here is a cross section. It's in this case, um, an eight meter high structure, five meter long geogrid with a surcharge on the top. Uh, and in this case, I've set phi of 39 degrees, so quite, quite a good fill. And the geogrid has a 28 kilonewton per meter long term design strength. So I then open up my analysis window. I, I open up this genetic algorithm, which allows me to populate the cross section with random surfaces like this. It's a very nice thing to watch and, and it's remarkably clever. Uh, and having done that, we then run it and we watch the program refining this down to find the lowest safety factor. And by this time here, it's, I've, I've got 110 generations now of the, of the surface. And I find a safety factor of 1.3, just over 1.3 for that situation. A, a very typical target. So what I'm going to do now, oh, sorry, yeah, there, there's the final analysis. So you can see it is a, a, a really nice two-part wedge that's, that's been created. And this is now strong soil, weak geogrid. I'm now going to switch over to weak soil, strong geogrid. And if I simply analyze the same surface, which I have done there, the safety factor about 1.47, quite a lot higher. So what I shall now do, I shall go back to my algorithm. I'll repopulate with random surfaces and run it again. And I find as I do this, I see appearing in front of my eyes, a two part wedge, but it's much lower down the structure now like that. So that's the situation with weak soil, strong geogrid. Safety factor also just over 1.3, similar to the previous one, 1.3. 
but a different arrangement of soil strengths and geogrid strength. If I now make the geogrid very long, was my last, my last case, if you remember, and analyze that, we get a safety factor of well over two. So if I now run the algorithm again, what do I find? It reduces down to a straight line, which is essentially the Rankine wedge. Safety factor just over two. So um, conclusion from this, this last number 11 point is that if you use tieback wedge, tieback wedge methods, which are, are used in many codes and standards, they rely on a single internal mechanism when they look at the internal stability, typically the Rankin or Coulomb wedge. And everything is based around that one mechanism. What I've just shown to you that that's not necessarily going to be critical. So in the two-part wedge approach, we don't do that. We look at very many different combinations of two-part wedges. We look at them from the base and at different levels up the structure to find uh, the, the best design. And this offers many advantages, which I haven't got time to talk about today. That would be going into the second series of 11 points. Um, but this offers many advantages over the tieback wedge method. So I've come to an end. We've covered these 11 points. Uh, I hope if you've managed to stay with me right through this, that you've found some things there maybe a bit different, uh, things that you, you hadn't seen before. Um, but I hope it's clarified a number of points and issues when it comes to the design of reinforced soil structures. So thank you very much. Just to remind you that in October, um, it'll be a kind of extension of the, of the topic today where we'll look at a specific reinforced soil structure type, which is load-bearing bridge abutments supported on, on polymer geogrid reinforced fill. Thank you very much.